Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Matthew, and good evening, all. Uh, so as Matthew said, I am Wayne Benjamin. I'm actually one of Matthew's neighbors in this lovely building here, the Grinnell 800 Riverside Drive, uh, which is you know, part of the Audubon Park Historic District. I am uh, an architect. My education is in architecture, city planning, and urban design. And I would say it's my training you know, in um, design and planning that initially uh, drew me to, um, you know, preservation. Uh, but I would also say that it's my work in community revitalization that also fostered um, an interest in it as well. Um, you know, so as an architect, I've always been interested in, you know, renovation and in adaptive reuse. And so that, that's uh, sort of a, a natural approach to, you know, looking at, um, you know, what's represented in a particular style of development or who was involved, but community revitalization. And I worked with Harlem Community Development Corporation for about 20 years. And Harlem CDC is a, a state agency that had um, a, a catchment area that covers most of upper Manhattan. And when I look at community revitalization, and we're going back to the mid 90s, when there were lots of vacant buildings and lots of vacant land um, in upper Manhattan. And I grew up in you know, Manhattan, actually I grew up in, in East Harlem. So I also remember parts of the city when you know, there was a tremendous amount of disinvestment. And when you look at community revitalization, to me, um, restoring, renovating a building says so much more about bringing back the community that you know was and is there than tearing down and building new. So it's kind of you know restoring versus you know building anew. Um, and you know part of you know historic preservation and development. Um, you know, fits right into that ethos of, you know, keeping what's there, um, perhaps putting it to uh, another use, but, you know, acknowledging the past and, and keeping it um, alive and active and of interest, you know, to the present. So I would say it's a combination of, you know, my education and training, um, but also interest in, you know, urban environments and, you know, what it takes to keep urban environments alive and well and healthy um, and moving forward. Thanks, Wayne. Um, while we're on this slide, before we move on, um, we've, we've talked on and off many times about preservation and about uh, human scale um, and how in, in many neighborhoods, uh, preservation helps to maintain a human scale neighborhood. But you've also pointed out, we've got the Grinnell there, uh, right there on the slide, um, that if we wanted to build the Grinnell today, we wouldn't be able to. Is that correct? Yeah, we wouldn't. And that's because um, the Grinnell and the Riviera, there are lots of buildings that were built before New York City had zoning. And if you were to build on that site today, uh, the Grinnell is, I think, both taller and covers more of the site than would be permitted as of right for a new building. Now, the height is a question because under what's considered um, height factor zoning, which is kind of the 1960, as long as you set back and don't break what's called the sky exposure plane, you can go as high as you want, although there are practical limits. But there's only a certain amount of the site area that you can cover and the, the Grinnell as it was designed and built in 1910, 1911, you know, covers more of the site than you would be allowed to build um, today. So it's a bulkier building. Um, that also brings into question, you know, whether or not there's something sacred about zoning and there isn't. Um, but if you look throughout, um, you know, New York City and upper Manhattan, there are buildings that are either taller than would be permitted um, under current zoning or um, have more square footage that would be permitted as of right. And in some cases, you know, those are wonderful buildings and, you know, preserving them is also a way of, you know, keeping in this case more housing um, on a site than you would be able to put brand new. Actually, uh, one of the projects I worked on at Harlem CDC 
These were you know, turn of the 20th century, actually end of the 19th century tenement buildings. And you know they occupied basically, if you put them together, an entire city block, although they were spread over two. So each half blocks that have been you know vacant probably since the late 1970s. And the developer that we were eventually working with, you know, saw no value in these old tenement shells and let's just tear it down and build new. And one of the things that convinced them to go otherwise is tearing them down would of course an additional million dollars and building new, I think would have been, um, you would have lost 30% of the square footage. Interesting, interesting. Thanks very much. Let's, um, let's move on to the next slide and to Vivian. Um, Vivian, I know you've worked in our neighborhood on um, one project for, for about five years now, expanding the Audubon Park Historic District. And now you're also working with the folks on preserving 857 Riverside Drive. I know from having worked with you that you are a dynamo and have tons of energy that sometimes exhausts me. Um, but how did, how did you get into historic preservation? What was it that interested you? I, I have a sort of range of things that got me in from personal to professional. I started out, I grew up on the Upper West Side. I grew up on West 72nd. And when I was a child, the sort of what's called Lincoln Square now, the Upper six, West, West 60s were very low rise. They were more like Washington Heights is now. And I remember when, by the time I was uh, out of high school, that same neighborhood of the West 60s along Broadway had become this really dense city of very kind of boring, in my opinion, sort of modern brick buildings of, you know, I don't know, 16 stories or more. And, and I also grew up hearing the trains at night because the train, the train yard at the bottom of West 72nd Street was alive and well. And I remember my mother then fighting to, you know, to keep the Trump buildings from going up, even though some of them have now taken the name Trump off them. But nonetheless, it's just this it's I try not to look at it when I go by on the West Side Highway because it's building after building very samey and very um, offensive in a way because it's different. I became a filmmaker, a documentary filmmaker, and I feel like I learned a lot from about anything from the work that I have done. And I was I when I worked at Columbia, sort of teaching faculty how to get to creatively use so-called new media. I spent two years working with Andrew Dolcart, who's a well-known preservationist and teaches at Columbia in preservation. And just hearing him and editing his material, he really woke me up to looking at buildings, to wondering about their history, to thinking about sort of the commercial history in New York. I also made a film separately about a man named Robert King, who's an a Harlem raised architect who's obsessed with gargoyles will talk to them and sort of through his eyes, the importance of um, decorative, um, the decorative features of old buildings became something that I look at all the time. So it's changed my, I also lived in a building that had been a total SRO that had had fires and people falling out windows on 81st street and Columbus Avenue. And I moved in, actually the first person to move into a block long building once it had been the whole inside had been gutted and restored um, i probably would have liked it better if the original old walls were there but it was proof that you could live in an 1890s building and it could be wonderful um, so it's been a range of reasons why um, i've been totally engaged in, in wanting um, to work to save what's really wonderful about the city thanks vivian um so it wasn't really, you, you didn't actually set out to be a preservationist. It was just a sort of uh, uh, different uh, influences from different people, different places and times in your life that all came together. Yes and no. It's funny because I ended up, when I was at Columbia, I, I realized that, or I was told that I wasn't using my educational credits and I should use them. And so what did I want to do? I wanted to get a master's in real estate preservation or historic preservation. And the same professor, Andrew Dolcart, said to me, but you can't do that because you're, you're going to do this part time. And we have all these field trips during the day. So we don't allow any part time employee types to do this. So I ended up getting a master's in real estate development. Um, and then I wrote a historical thesis because what I really wanted to do was preservation. So I kind of 
you know, it, it, I backed into it this way and I actually sell real estate now is one of the things that I do. And I'm, I, I'm sort of obsessed. I send people like old articles about the buildings that they're buying into. It's just, it's, it's sort of who I've become. And one more thing while we're, while we're still on this slide, I've actually read your, your, your thesis, which is really interesting. And actually I listed it as a, um, a source in, in my, my book. Um, oh my you, you wrote about the Riviera, which is right there in the center of the screen and the period when they were dividing, the, the owner was dividing it into, um, dividing the apartments into smaller ones, wasn't that? Uh, well, it's interesting because of, of the five wings of my building in 1938, I mean, this was really interesting in the thirties as these buildings that had huge apartments where more and more apartments were empty because people couldn't, didn't have servants, couldn't afford the rent. And a Columbia professor in 1931 wrote an article about what if you cut up and created smaller apartments and you had no more maids rooms, no more dining rooms because you didn't have the staff, then um, you could make any landlord could make a lot more money because the entire, uh, the all the apartments would be rented. And in my building, MetLife bought it in 1938 and they took sort of two of the um, areas of long side-by-side -side apartments and they cut them up basically to compete with new deco buildings and they created one bedrooms and um, a studio and they had learned by then that people wanted foyers because they had to say goodbye to their guests without a servant. They wanted deep closets. They would have, they wanted dressing rooms. So I live in a building that's kind of schizoid because it's got the thirties on one side. And I live in an original development building where, you know, when someone rings the doorbell, our living room is way down the apartment. And we look at each other, like who's going to answer the door. There's no servant. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So Let's, uh, let's move on to the next slide. And um, Joe, you are a more recent um, preservationist. Uh, suppose you tell the folks what drew you into the whole idea and the, the concept of, of architectural historic preservation. Yeah, so I, uh, um, I consider myself, and I've, I've used this term before, I call myself now an accidental preservationist um, because I, do not come at this with any kind of education or training or background in architecture or preservation or community activism. Um, but I, I'm a, a journalist by trade uh, and a television writer, and I've written on a variety of topics um, in papers and magazines uh, and so forth. Um, but never on architecture. But for me, it was um, just a matter of, well, I guess it's amazing what a pandemic can do uh, when you've got a lot of free time on your hands. I, a few months ago, I was walking down the street and I saw flyers on all these cars. And I thought, wow, I haven't seen flyers on cars in I don't know how long. Um, you know, somebody's rocking it old school and trying to get a message out, where, what's the message? So I, I took one and learned about um, <clears throat> the, the initial story of 857 Riverside Drive, which is a little house uh, just down the block from where I live. Um, and I always thought it looked intriguing. It's this old, tiny looking house. And indeed it's built in 1851. Um, and it, the, the little flyer said that, um, you know, a developer had bought the property and was planning to bulldoze it to put up a 13 story sliver tower, uh, which would be more than twice as tall as anything else around um, <clears throat> and would put in 46 apartments where there's now one family dwelling um, and on what is a pretty narrow street. Um, and so I thought, oh, that's, that's, that doesn't sound good. Um, and then I eventually uh, saw a, a story online, um, basically about the sale and, and basically explaining the whole thing. So I thought, well, I guess I should just find out what's going on. And I Googled the developer's name and controversy or scandal, just, just to see what comes up. And sure enough, 
you know, up pops up the, the public advocates worst uh, landlords in New York City list, where we just where I discovered that this, this particular developer has um, been on the, the worst landlords list twice, two years in a row now, um, with um, uh, 620 outstanding housing violations. And I thought, oh, this is not, see, you know, the aesthetics of the thing, be having this anomalous um, building on the street is, is bad enough, but to think that it's going to be built by some guy who clearly doesn't have the wherewithal or the ability or the interest in caring for the number of properties that he already has that have all kinds of problems. Um, and I thought, isn't this always what happens? These guys get to just put up these buildings. They don't take care of them. There are all kinds of violations. They get listed with, you know, on lists with all kinds of violations, but nothing ever really seems to happen. And they get, they just get to keep on putting up more buildings. And then I thought, oh, and isn't this what always happens? You know, I, I hear about this kind of thing. I grouse about it. I say, oh, that's wrong. That's wrong. Somebody should do something about it. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe that somebody is me. Maybe I should finally, you know, sitting around with too much time on my hands because of COVID um, uh, uh, made me think, you know, I've certainly got time now. Um, I can't use that as an excuse. Um, and, and I, I just, I wanted to feel like I was making a difference in a small, in some kind of small way. Um, and I think that's maybe something that's in the zeitgeist now, you know, after a year of all of us sitting around and wondering, my God, what can, what can we do to help ourselves, to help our family, to help our community, um, you know, in a time of dire strife? Um, I thought, oh, well, I guess, this is something that I could do. Um, so I, I signed, you know, there was a little uh, email at the bottom of the flyer. And so I signed up and quite honestly, uh, Matthew, I, I assumed that it would entail maybe having to go to a, one or two Zoom meetings and, you know, and I would sign a petition and that would be about it. But the next thing I knew I had been sort of roped into, um, uh, writing a report about the history of the house. Um, and uh, we used initial um, facts that you uncovered, Matthew, um, and were then are detailed in your book, um, uh, The Neighborhood Manhattan Forgot, uh, which is an excellent book, by the way. Uh, and, and we discovered that, you know, the, you discovered, I should say, that the owner of the house was connected to the uh, Underground Railroad, the initial owner of the house. Uh, so with that, I started then digging around and uncovered that in fact, he um, not only built that house and, and businesses that, that you discussed in the book, but that there was actually this burgeoning colony of abolitionists who were moving uptown uh, at a time when uptown was pastures and orchards and and country fields. Uh, and this was really significant because nobody has really known that any real, any, any abolitionists existed up here. If you click on the Landmarks Commission uh, website to look up what information they have about the Underground Railroad and abolitionism, it all takes place downtown and in Brooklyn, you know, for the most part. So this was really significant. And so basically at that point then, I was hooked because I saw that, wow, from just digging and doing the kinds of things that I could do, you know, from being a journalist, I sort of employed my research skills. Um, I could, you know, we were able to discover this um, new fact about this neighborhood and, and a real reason for keeping this building safe um, besides just the fact that uh, we don't want to see a big ugly tower going up, that there's a real historic value to maintaining it. Um, so that's basically how I got sucked into the world that you all have uh, a lot more experience in. Uh, but 
you know. But but I think a really good good point there, Joe, is and particularly for folks who are are listening, is that it takes a lot of different skills to work on a preservation project. And you brought something to this project of 857 Riverside that was desperately needed. And that was research ability from your, from your journalism and writing ability so that you were able to put together and craft this really marvelous request for evaluation that the, the group then sent into Landmarks Preservation Commission. So, I mean, we have, we've had now three different folks, uh, Wayne and Vivian and Joe, all talk about their different backgrounds, their particular skills, how they, they came together. And I hope that the folks who are listening might be thinking about what your particular skills are if there were a project or you wanted to work with other people on a project in your neighborhood, what it is that you might bring to the mix. Um, so now that we've talked a little bit about what brought everyone to uh, historic preservation, um, let's, let's go a little bit more into the projects. And Joe, you've, you've spoken a little bit about, about yours, eight, eight, the one that you're working on now, uh, 857 Riverside Drive. And I think we, um, that's been in the news a lot. We don't wanna get stuck on that too much because uh, we have a lot of things to cover. But would you just give the, the listeners um, a brief overview of what has happened since the moment that you turned in the request for evaluation? Ah, well, we, we sent in the report, which basically explained that, there, that this home had a connection to um, a, a, a sort of a major player in the Underground Railroad in New York City. Um, and, uh, and not only that, but is sort of geographically at the center of this uh, colony or community of like-minded neighbors um, who uh, attended uh, the, the church that uh, the, the builder of uh, 857 Riverside, a gentleman named Dennis Harris, uh, he and his compatriot John Newhouse um, built uh, businesses in the area and they also built a church which uh, had a, a definite, a strong anti-slavery stance uh, at a time when that was not guaranteed from every church, even up here in the North, even here in New York City. Um, uh, uh, so uh, his church, however, did, and it brought in a lot of uh, community members, including several prominent community members who are folks who are mentioned in your book. So we included that in the report. Uh, and were uh, quite pleased with it and were promptly rejected by the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Unfortunately, uh, they dismissed it for various reasons, which we can get into maybe at some point. But um, uh, what happened then after that is that this thing took on a life of its own. Uh, the, the New York Times found out about the report and about the sort of hasty rejection and uh, looked into it and uh, John Freeman Gill, who is a columnist for the Streetscapes column, uh, wrote a beautiful uh, cover story uh, on our efforts. And then that um, helped uh, get our elected, uh, our local elected officials involved. And um, uh, Gail Brewer, the Manhattan Borough President, she uh, kindly offered to host a press conference where we had um, a variety of, of, um, of our elected officials come and speak about their support for this issue. And it got picked up uh, on every major television station, on most major radio stations in the area, uh, and in many print and online publications. So it was just uh, phenomenal. Um, so, uh, and so that's sort of where we are at the moment. We are now, you know, looking into uh, ways that we can further uh, the cause. We're, we're continuing to try to come up with more uh, research to prove stronger links and additional links to um, abolitionists and famous abolitionists of the day um, that would be connected to the house and to this area. Um, and we are, we are now um, 
we've sent a report to the mayor's office, hoping that he might get involved. Um, and 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 our fingers are crossed that um, these folks who so far that the ones who have spoken out for us have been tremendous in terms of their support for um, all the ideas that that you. Um, that have just been discussed about the need to preserve community and the need to preserve certain aesthetic values in a neighborhood or aesthetic um, sites or buildings in a neighborhood that help create that neighborhood, to help create the character of that neighborhood. Right. And I, I think one of the one other point to mention there is that one of the strategies in the in the uh, the group that's heading this is taking a lot of different strategies uh, to, to try to save this house. But one of them also is to expand beyond the idea of just the house and look at, okay, we have an Audubon Park Historic District, which is just two blocks, actually a block and a half, south of this house. And we have talked before about expanding that. So could we expand the Audubon Park Historic District to include all of the buildings, not just focusing on this one individual structure, but all the ones around it, which are related to it in the sense that Harris owned all of that property. It was developed, it went through an urbanization process similar to, to Audubon Park. And Vivian, I think that um, that's, that takes us over to you and let, let's move to the, uh, we can move to the next slide, but why don't you talk a little bit or would you talk a little bit about the uh, ongoing effort to expand the Audubon Park Historic District to include those houses on 158th Street. Sure. Um, I guess it was, what was it, five years ago? Four or five years ago? I think it was four. Uh, five. Well, whatever it was, I saw, uh, I just happened to be going through Street Easy, the website, and saw that two houses on that block, and it's a block of 12, it's on the bottom of your screen, it's uh, 12 row houses that were built, um, a chunk of them were built in 1897 and the rest in 1898. Um, and I saw that two of them were on the market and I was really disturbed by that. Um, it talked about their development potential. It's like, oh God, here we go again. So um, I reached out to Matthew and I, um, we started working on, we actually got Andrew, Andrew Dolcart to write the descriptions for us to um, uh, to, to put, to try to put together a report, we did put together, um, a request for evaluation, um, to the Landmarks Preservation. One of the nicest things was that we received a six to celebrate award, which are six projects that, uh, the, the HDC, the Historic Districts Council, your host for tonight, give out, um, to projects that are worthy almost as an encouragement. And one of the things you get is access to people at HTC. And I felt that Simeon Bankoff and some of his, you know, the other staff were really helpful in terms of teaching us kind of what, the, at least I didn't know what the steps were in terms of reaching out to your elected officials and holding meetings in the community. So you get to know who the people are, trying to get to know the people on the street to get their buy-in. Um, it was an education for me, as well as something that you, you know, once you get involved with something like this, it becomes your passion. Um, through a meeting that I held, um, that we held, I got to know somebody who grew up on the block and through her, we began to know other stories that weren't immediately out there. Um, so it just, it kind of, it kind of takes over, but in a really interesting way. It does indeed, and I think you just um, you pointed out something else that I think is a really a joy of uh, working on a historic preservation project, and that is you do become more acquainted with people in your neighborhood. Um, <laughs> and uh, as in uh, you mentioned, one of the, the folks who uh, had a house there on uh, 158th Street, West 158th Street, who has become really a good friend of both yours and mine. And um, it's a very entertaining person who I had never, you know, we've, we've shared a neighborhood for probably 30 plus years and I just didn't know her. Um, so that's, that's another of the, the joys that goes along with some of the woes. Um, Wayne, I know that you've worked, uh, you know, helped us with all of these projects in the immediate neighborhood, but as a member of Community Board 12 and as the head of the Land Use Committee, you've seen 
uh, many other projects in northern Manhattan. Any of those you'd like to uh, mention or talk about a bit? Um, well, sure. And actually, uh, being on uh, the community board and being on the land use committee, which um, I was drafted to, because most community board members, they, they get to, to say what committee they would like to be on. And when I came to CB12, they said, you're going to be on land use and you're going to chair. And that was in 2003, and I have not been released since. But um, I think one of the first uh, applications that came before us for um, historic designation was, in fact, Audubon Park. And what is interesting is, as a resident of the area, I was involved in some of the advocacy and, and wrote a letter of support that was part of the package that went to you know, LPC. And so when it came before the land use committee um, to evaluate, you know, one of the things I was evaluating is, was my own letter of support. Um, but we also have looked at the United Palace, uh, which was recently, um, you know, designated, and I might say designated over the objection, oddly enough, of the, the owners. Um, in Inwood, there was a lot of work done even prior to the Six to Celebrate, as Vivian mentioned, they also received the Six to Celebrate um, in Inwood. But prior to that, there was what was referred to, I believe, as an Art Deco apartment house district study. But in fact, all of the buildings are not Art Deco. So it's really you know, an apartment house district study that um, really uh, highlights the, the, the development in Inwood and how it parallels to some extent the development that was going on at that time, the Grand Concourse. As a matter of fact, some of the same architects who designed the now designated buildings on the Grand Concourse designed the same apartment buildings in Inwood. Uh, but you know, there, there were a number of presentations uh, before the community board. The community board for the last decade has been very supportive of uh, historic preservation and historic designations in Upper Manhattan. And it's not just for aesthetic reasons. And if you look at 857, you really can't in 2021 make the aesthetic argument. If you go back to 1965 and you look at the New York City preservation law, it does not say that in order to be designated only architectural merit is considered is architectural, historical, and cultural. And if you look at history and culture, what is often the case is the communities in Upper Manhattan, and those are often communities of color, their history and culture, their contributions to history and culture are not given the same level of attention. And I think that is one of the reasons why, you know, community board 10 in Central Harlem, community board nine, in West Harlem and Community Board 12 in Washington Heights and Inwood and Community Board 11 in East Harlem have focused on, okay, not just what are the buildings and the places that merit designation, but also what happened in our communities, who lived here, what are their contributions to the history and culture of the city and of the nation, of the nation that merit um, you know, designation. So the, the points that uh, Vivian made about the West 158th Street row houses, if you go back to 2009, when Community Board 12 um, voiced its support for the designation of Audubon Park, it also pointed out that if you're, if you're looking at the area sort of as a time capsule of development that was driven by the Northern extension of the IRT number one, and of Riverside Drive. So you're looking at the urbanization of this part of Upper Manhattan that was never expected to, to be urbanized because the Manhattan grid stops at 155th Street. So it stops where watch nights begin. You wanna take a look at more fully how the area urbanized. And so the pre-World War I buildings is certainly a part of that, but what happened after World War I, World War II? What happened when the economy changed? So we suggested looking at 
not just the area that eventually was designated, but also what we locally refer to as the upper and lower drive, which is basically Riverside Drive north of 158th Street, basically going to, to 160th, 161st. Um, but also, you know, the River Terrace and River Arts, which would be, I guess, the, the latter phase of development, you know, uh, along the viaduct, because that will tell you sort of three historical, you know, points in time and how development happened. And so if you're looking at this, you know, as a journalist or as a historian, it's okay, you have this era and these are the forces that drove it. You have this era and these are the forces and this is how it relates to the prior and then you have this. And for the most part, you know, I guess River Arts and, and River Terrace would be the latest phase of development in the area. But, you know, it's kind of a scholarly approach to looking at, you know, urban design and urban development and the architectural aspects of it, but also the history of that. Um, we, we meaning the community board, we undertook, I think the first ever district-wide um, neighborhood planning and land use study, sort of circa 2007. And there is a whole chapter in that that's focused on um, historic resources and looking at um, the buildings that at that time were designated, but also looking at buildings that buildings and districts that merit consideration. And I would say today that study still represents a roadmap for things that can be advanced and it still represents a roadmap for things that LPC should be looking at. And I would say that we have as a community board uh, attempted to engage LPC on a number of occasions, you know, just to have a conversation like we're having a conversation today to let them know our areas of interest. I um, mean, we understand that everything can't be landmarked. And even the, the Audubon Park District, which took, I think, six years, that was considered quick. So we understand that, you know, it's a time, you know, it's a time consuming process, but having the dialogue, you know, is, is helpful. And it's, it's unfortunate that we have not been successful in engaging them, although I would say last week we passed a resolution uh, once again calling for them to engage with the community board and the um, community broadly, and also to ensure they have greater equity and inclusion in their designations. And that resolution happened to coincide nicely with all of the um, publicity that 857 uh, is getting. So we actually got a response from LPC where they now want to talk to the community board. Which is, which is really excellent, really excellent. Thank you, thank you for explaining all of that, Wayne. And, and for, the, uh, for the folks listening, the map there on the lower left shows what Wayne was talking about. You can see the outline of the Audubon Park Historic District. And when that was being decided, the boundaries were being decided, the community board had suggested going all the way up that winding path of Riverside Drive that you can see on the map and including the buildings over there along the river. If you look there in the photograph on the uh, lower right, in the far background, you see River Terrace, which was built in the 1960s, a Mitchell Lama building. And as Wayne says, it's a, it's a part of our history. It's also there. You can't be any place in the Audubon Park Historic District that you can't see River Terrace. So it is a part of our, our fabric, our streetscape that really, um, really should be part of our historic district as well. So let's move to the last slide once more. Uh, this is one other thing I'd like to point out on the map there. Yeah, on the left, um, this slide is from a Landmarks Preservation Commission has recently uh, put out a wonderful map that shows all the historic districts and buildings designations in uh, all of uh, greater New York. This is just Manhattan. But I think if you look there um, and you see the all of the pink and the yellow and the blue uh, there below, say, what is that Central Park? And then you move up and there's still a lot. And then you get up to 155th Street and you can see the dirt of designations north of that point, which gives everyone on this call both um, a joy and a woe. The joy is that we've got a lot of open space, a lot of places that could be designated uh, in your neighborhoods, um, but also it's convincing 
Landmarks Preservation Commission that we really do have these wonderful areas in northern Manhattan that they need to look at. Um, and I think it's, you know, recently there was a, um, I can't remember the, the name of the document that the uh, uh, chair of the commission released, uh, but it has- The framework. The fra that's it, equity e framework. E Thank equity you. framework. And two of the main points in it were to recognize the diversity of New York City, which we've been talking about some already, particularly in the importance of the black history uh, related to the abolitionist movement uh, and the has that we have connected to that movement. But the, one of the other things was underserved areas. And I think it's very clear from that map where the underserved areas in Manhattan are. Yeah. So, not, not to interrupt you, Matthew, sure, no, please do. Now, at the, the Land Use Committee last week, we actually talked about that equity framework. And one of the questions is, you know, when you look at it and you kind of review it, some of the framework is kind of the mechanics of how LPC goes about doing its business and looking at diversifying some of the consultants it uses. But it wasn't clear to what extent um, that equity framework is addressing the, the issues we're talking about of the diversity of what gets designated and whose stories get told. So one of the questions that we asked our district manager to pose to LPC is, how are they going to measure the success of that equity framework? And how does each component of the framework serve to further diversity and inclusion. So those questions were posed, I believe, earlier today. And we'll wait to see what the answer is. Um, but the whole reason we decided to discuss it in the Land Use Committee was, you know, the timing was interesting. Um, it, it's great to say that you've got, you know, uh, a framework for uh, equity, but what does it really mean? What, how do you, you know, put it into action, and what do you expect the results to be? Right. If I can <clears throat> jump in jump in here for a second. Um, I, not being familiar at all <clears throat> with um, landmarks or how this whole procedure worked, um, I, I was confronted with this same map early on because I, I wanted to know, well, just, you know, how many uh, landmarks are uptown uh, or anywhere else. And just the, the, the image of that, I think, is, is fairly stunning. I mean, it, the, the, where you see the pink and all the dots and the colors and where you don't um, is, is fairly stark. And even, even in Harlem, where it's sort of a lightish pink, um, you know, when you consider the number of buildings, when you consider the reasons why people move to Harlem, oh, because it's so beautiful. Oh, because there are still so many homes that have the old cornices and the old, you know, some of the, the old molding and, you know, where uh, at least 10 or 20 years ago, there hadn't been a huge amount of, of modern buildings going up. You would think that there would, there would be more dots up there. Um, when I read about the framework myself, I thought if they really plan to do this, I think they have to take a long, hard look at how much the aesthetic factor, uh, the architectural factor of a building, how much weight that that one particular factor amongst, as Wayne was saying, the social and the cultural and the historical uh, significance of a building, how much that aesthetic factor really plays in their decision because the fact is that that owners uptown traditionally, historically, had just not had the cash on hand to keep up a house. Anybody who has a house knows darn well um, that it just, it, it's, you know, sucks money like nobody's business and and it's tough. And so you have to make some tough decisions. Sometimes you have to um, put up stucco uh, on front in order to deal with uh, um, uh, insulation problems because that's the cheaper mode because you don't have the money 
to to hire uh, an an architect or someone who's going to be able to um, preserve uh, your building in the way that it appears that the Landmarks Commission really wants it to be preserved. Um, when they rejected us, they uh, gave an example in their, they gave several examples in their letter. They, they said that, you know, we're very interested in the abolitionist cause and, and we have in fact um, uh, landmarked uh, several buildings connected to the Underground Railroad and abolitionism and they listed uh, four or five. And I put, I, they, they were just uh, sort of a handful of the uh, 17, I think that are, uh, of their total listening, but just of that handful that they threw out as examples of the good work they do in terms of uh, investigating New Yorkers' involvement with abolitionism um, and promoting those stories. The, of, the majority of the ones that they listed were all in more well-to-do neighborhoods um, in uh, uh, Brooklyn and Manhattan and on Staten Island. And I thought, well, there it is, there is this systemic bias that is baked into that system. And they're, they're going, just as we're having, we're all having to look long and hard at the systems we're involved in and the subtle and unexpected and unintentional ways that, that racism is baked into things and um, privilege is baked into things. I, it seems to me that with landmarks, um, and not just here in New York, but na nationally, um, I know the National Register also takes a huge into, into consideration to a large degree, the aesthetics of a building. And in areas where people just didn't have the money to keep buildings up in areas where people were redlined uh, in areas where people were not given mortgages um, on, in a systemic way, um, certain you know certain uh, ethnicities, you know people were not given access to funds to keep up these buildings. Um, there, if if you just stick to the old way of doing it, their their buildings are going to be bulldozed. Their stories will be forgotten, uh, and their culture will be wiped away. Yeah. Good, good point, Joe. And I, I think one of the interesting things was, as you mentioned in the letter, uh, receiving a reply from LPC that they were always on the lookout for these and would, you know, look for others in northern Manhattan. It's like, okay, if you find another house that's related to the abolitionist mo movement in northern Manhattan, let us know. Um, we've, we've talked now about um, joys and woes. I don't want to, we've got about what, maybe eight minutes left. I don't see any questions from the audience at the moment. Um, do we want to open up the um, mics, Diego, or, or? Yeah, yeah, okay. let's do that. See if there's some, I, I see that there's one person here, Susan uh, Yawa has a question. Um, let me see, Susan, is your mic open? Can you talk? Or do I need to do that? No, well, my mic is open. Thank you. Oh, very good. Thank you. Hi, hi, everyone. Um, it's been a really interesting conversation. I live around the corner from 857, and I uh, just got an announcement about this uh, talk today, so I thought I would join um, for various reasons. So um, I guess I just want to share some things that I'm thinking about and want to know if they resonate in any way with folks. And I'm particularly interested in the equity framing that. Wayne brought up and others, Wayne Benjamin brought up and others have spoken to and how to do it in a way that's really authentic. And so I just wanna share a few sort of concepts that come to mind for me that I think really are important to center because at the end of the day, buildings are not people. They do not hold cult culture. People are the ones who embody culture. So we're not gonna lose culture by losing buildings even though I think it is very important to retain buildings. And, and sites, you know, the physical, wherever feasible. So, okay, so the three things are one, you know, nothing about us without us, right? And that comes out of South African organizing and disability organizing. So what are the ways that people in the community are really brought into thinking about the stories that they want to tell of their, of their communities? Um, and how, um, 
you know, so not, I think it's wonderful that in the process of doing this work, you get to know your neighbors, but that may not be enough, right, to really bring in their ideas. Um, secondly, I'm thinking about work that I did in Ghana with the, um, in, with the Department of um, uh, Archaeology and Heritage Studies. And, you know, you might think that a lot of work that they're doing is about external tourism, getting people to come into Ghana. But I think there's something really powerful about internal tourism. And by engaging people in the community, they come to see their own community. We get to see our own community as a teaching landscape. You know, so even when we can't save buildings, we can put out placards, right? Like equal justice in Montgomery, Alabama or the, the Freedom Trail in Boston. And I think that's a way of also communities projecting themselves into the future and thinking about 50 years from now, what do I want my descendants to know, to access, to come in, 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 in um, to encounter? And I think those are really, you know, important things to think about when you're thinking about engaging people in uh, thinking about landmarks. Thanks very much for that, Susan. And um, I think we have your email. Would you mind if afterwards I contact you and we maybe can uh, continue that conversation? You're muted. Great. <laughs> and actually, quite frankly, what Susan just mentioned, I think that is the intent of HDC's initiative. I mean, they started, you know, in the Bronx, uh, you know, but the focus is on communities that, you know, if you looked at all those pink dots, you know, communities where the pink dots were not represented and going to those communities and, you know, starting conversations and actually inviting the local reps to be the speakers and to tell their stories and moving that initiative um, not moving, expanding that initiative from the Bronx to Upper Manhattan. And Upper Manhattan, you know, parts of Harlem has, you know, a, a history of some advocacy, but people will walk by, you know, buildings every day and either not notice um, the uniqueness or the beauty of it or not know what happened there during you know, the Harlem Renaissance or during you know, civil rights or what happened there last year. So the idea of engaging the community and having them not only tell their stories, but understand the, the history and the merit of you know, the environment that they you know, occupy every day. Right. Yeah. Can I speak to that? A please little? do, please. Oh, what has always interested me is sort of the histories within buildings. And at some point I had a grant to do oral histories of people talking about the sort of decades of people. And if I had the time and could get the money, I would keep doing it. We also had um, money from the New York Public Library at some point, and they looked to people in the community to interview. And I interviewed a lot of people in River Terrace and other places to talk about what the community was, what what their, what they did for the community. So I think, I mean, there there are other ways. The one thing that concerned me was in what Susan said is that I'm always afraid that developers will, you know, knock something down but put up a plaque and say, here before we put up this monstrosity was a house that you know that abolitionists lived in. So there's sort of a you want the history recorded but you don't necessarily want it to be gratuitous to be put on any kind of building that was there uh, that's really interesting that you bring that up because i was actually just going to bring up oral histories and how we need to engage the community but also document the histories in the long term so i live in morningside heights i consult in hamilton heights and my thesis work at columbia under andrew dolcart is with the washington heights holocaust refugee community um, and this is a very much a fading community, unfortunately. And something that I'm doing is I will be doing by the end of the month, 20 oral histories have finished that of people talking about their heritage, documenting the sites in their own words um, about why this was important and how they want this to be remembered. So this keeps, this keeps the engagement from being temporary. People move, people pass away, but ultimately we now have these stories documented. And this is so important in preservation because we are preserving for the long term. These voices should also be heard in the long term, even if they're no longer physically here. 
Thank you. I, I, I also um, am struck by something Susan said. Uh, and, I, and I shared an email a couple of weeks ago with some of my colleagues. Um, and I forgot where I was quoting from, but basically it said that, you know, if we are only interested in buildings when it comes to preservation, that's a problem because buildings are the backdrop. People are, in fact, you know, the history and culture. So, I mean, but as an architect, and I've got four degrees in architecture, I'm not saying the, 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 you know, the buildings are not important. And, you know, there are examples of this is the first example of X, or this is the best example of Y, or, you know, this cluster, why it's important. So, you know, let's not forget that, you know, part of what the 1965 preservation law um, is intended to preserve is architecture. And if you think about what Penn Station was, and even now they're talking about Moynihan Hall, it's still not the old Penn Station that was destroyed. So we want to preserve, you know, the buildings that, you know, we have created, but also going back to the law, you know, we also want to preserve, you know, the history and culture of, you know, the people that contribute to and have contributed to this city and this nation. Perfect closing remarks, Wayne. Thank you. Um, Diego, it looks like we're right at the hour. Do you have any uh, any other things you need to uh, tell the audience before we sign off for the evening? Oh, thanks so much, everyone, for joining. Um, as Wayne said, uh, at the Historic Districts Council, we'll, we're looking to engage um, underrepresented communities. And uh, we've been doing this in the Bronx. Tomorrow, we have a, a meeting in the Bronx, where a Zoom meeting, where we are going to invite uh, Tad's crew that's true, it's a very iconic uh, graffiti group uh, in, in the Bronx and they contributed to the um, cultural evolution of, of the Bronx. So we were focusing on the cultural heritage heritage of, of the Bronx. So uh, as Wayne was saying, not, not everything has to be architectural significant, but um, we're also trying to uncover and highlight the cultural significance of uh, places. In, in New York City. So thank you so much to the speakers. I think it was a very wonderful, wonderful talk. And if you have questions, please feel free to email me. You all have my email. And uh, if you're interested in joining to tomorrow's meeting with Tad's crew, you can email me as well. And I'll send you the, the link so you can join. And I look forward to another meeting uh, with this group, with Matthew and more people from Upper Manhattan. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye.